So we've been going for uh, over 10 years now, and actually our work started um, with cancer detection, and some of you may have heard of this work, so there were anecdotal stories that dogs were able to smell cancer in their owners, and um, this starts to build a bit of a body of evidence as a letter to the Lancet, and um, I was very lucky to meet with the doctor that had written this letter, and we decided in 2002 to see if we could train a dog to detect cancer. Now, you can imagine in those early days there was so much scepticism. Um, I was known as the mad dog lady and um, still am to a large extent. But um, there was huge scepticism firstly about, well, you know, uh, is this really true? Is it some, is somebody made it up? But also, if it is true, dogs can smell cancer. You know, what does that mean? Does it really mean anything? You know, is it just something which is just going to be of interest but never going to change anything in terms of diagnosis? I'm glad to say that we've come an awful long way in the uh, 10 years, in fact it was our 10th anniversary last year, and as you can see we were demonstrated to a very important lady um, at her home, and it was actually her stables, we were allowed in her stables. So, and Peanut on the right there is our Parkinson's detector dog working in front of Her Majesty the Queen, um, and um, we're going to show you a bit about, you know, obviously how the dogs work and what they're able to achieve, but very exciting times. And this is our, our, our centre and um, research and training centre, i say, just in, just in Buckinghamshire. So if we look about dogs and their relationship with people and what they've been able to do for people over the years, actually in terms of um, looking at it in a, in a sort of scientific way, the research is really quite recent. In fact, when I was at university doing my first degree, I was very lucky to be involved in the early work where dogs were being taken into nursing homes just to you know, see that they affected people's psychology, in fact, made them feel better. And then this got slightly more um, advanced. We started to realise that they were also changing people's physiology. So if you stroke your dog, then it lowers your heart, plate, heart rate and blood pressure. And if you actually have a relationship with that dog, you know, if, you, if, you, if it's your dog, it actually it, it reduces your heart rate and blood pressure even more than the unfamiliar dog. So lots of interest. And also that, we then, that it was then discovered that it was reducing blood lipids, so there's nasty fats in your blood. If you actually were stroking a dog, it would reduce these. So a huge amount of sort of work was being done, but no work in terms of using the dog in health diagnosis, which is now, as I say, much, much more recent. So this is Florin, one of my best... Um, prostate cancer detection dogs and she can detect prostate cancer at 85% reliability. She's worked on thousands of samples and she has a 0.5 mil of urine, so a very, very small amount of urine. And we're doing huge amounts now in prostate detection, working with, um, in the US with um, MIT, so looking at how we can take what Florin knows with her nose into actually an artificial nose that can work in the future. And how does it all work? Well, it's actually not 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 complicated at all we all have our own odors we have our personal odor which is our dna odor which just means that we can be tracked for many many miles by a dog you know across other people's tracks that because that's because we have a unique smell ourselves what happens when we have a disease or condition is that our, our smell is modified slightly either by bacteria um, or the actual um, hormonal change in our body that's been caused um, by the disease or in cancer by, by cancer volatiles. And these can be detected by dogs who have this incredibly, incredibly good sense of smell. Now, our work actually has gone into two ways. So the work you're seeing today falls under our biodetection side, and that is when a dog makes a, a, a detection of a disease or the volatiles associated with that disease from a stand. So they're given a sample that's collected from an individual and this could either be urine or breath or sweat and that is presented to a dog on a stand so the dog doesn't go around sniffing at people. <laughs> so you'll be, very, you'll be glad to know we won't, we won't be sending the dog around today. So the um, other side of our work is our medical assistance dogs and that's where a dog does work one-on-one -on -one for an individual. So like a guide dog or a hearing dog, the dog works with the person 24 hours and is warning them of an oncoming mer medical emergency. Now that would be for somebody who has a diagnosed condition, who has rapid changes in their condition, so their condition becomes acute. So I'm talking about people with type 1 diabetes who have lost hyperglycemic awareness, so don't realise that their blood sugars are dropping dangerously low. 
people with Addison's disease. Um, we have a number of individuals with POTS, a sort of drop attack. Um, and also we have people who suffer anaphylaxis with allergens, so the dogs would, would warn them of allergens in the environment. So we have about 150 of these partnerships working around the UK and we um, are increasingly are asked, you know, having huge numbers of applications for dogs. But yeah, we're going to focus on the, the buyer detection dogs today. And as we've talked a lot today, when you start talking about any diagnostic system, and, and, and our previous speakers have covered this extremely well, you're talking about sensitivity and specificity. How reliably does the dog tell you the disease is there if it is? And how reliably the, does the dog tell you the disease is not there if it isn't? This is um, basically how a diagnostic instrument. And if you like, if you, I don't know how many here people are dog lovers. Any of you dog lovers? Oh, there's quite a few dog lovers, that's good. Then, um, it really doesn't matter that the dog is the biosensor and he has a wet nose and a, and a waggy tail. He must be measured in exactly the same way as any other biosensor. So um, our earlier speaker talked about biomarkers. The dog has to be measured in exactly the same robust way to ensure that if he's making a detection, that is a, it is a true detection. And I'll talk a little bit about how we, we as in, in training, uh, make sure we do this. So one of the things I was interested in doing after the, cancer, the first cancer studies, and I say we've carried on with the cancer studies ever since, is looking at our dog's ability to um, detect low levels of odour in an environment which wasn't, we weren't blowing headspace, or we weren't capturing volatiles and um, uh, blowing them across the dog's nose. We were asking the dog to go out and find the odour in a pot. And we were looking at something called amylacetate, which smells a bit like pear drops at high levels to humans. And we started to, to di dilute this odour down to very, very low levels. Now, humans who have um, a reasonable sense of smell, so going up to human super sniffers, could, could detect this in about one part per 10,000. So you dilute your amylacetate into mineral oil, and we, the best humans could smell it about one part ten per 10,000. We had Jo Malone at our site, um, a few months ago and she's the perfumer and she could go down much lower than that interestingly because she's a super sniffer. Um, but I don't know if any of you can guess what the dogs were able to go down to, so one part, so diluting a part. So a dog like Bumper was able to go down to parts per trillion. Now us humans get a bit lost in trillions, I certainly do, but a trillion would be the equivalent, if anybody can smell a teaspoon of sugar in a cup of tea, which apparently some people can if they have a partner who has sugar and tea. The dog could smell it in the volume of water in two Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's parts per trillion. So we're getting quite low, and beyond that, you, it's very hard to measure these levels, actually, without having very complex machinery in order to, to provide the sample to the dog. Now, something we're really proud of is that we decided that it was one of the problem areas is false positive, and you don't want um, an indication, a diagnostic indication that somebody's got a disease when they haven't. Now, there's always this um, confusion. People used to say, well, how can you believe a dog? You know, dogs just tell you what they think you want them to tell you, don't they? So they wag their tails if they think there's a biscuit, and you know. So we have to be absolutely sure that our dogs are only making a proper detection. Now, how do we change that? Well, the way we changed it was by not only rewarding for indication, so if I'm giving an after-dinner speech to give an example, I would say, OK, I have a room full of um, a bankers, for example. I'm trying to get their money out to give to the charity. And I say, we couldn't bring our cancer detection dog today, but we have brought our cocaine detector dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that's all all right with you. And what the dog's going to do is he's going to go along each person in turn, and he's going to tell me whether or not you're carrying cocaine. Well, there's quite a rush to the toilet at this point. <laughs> So the point I'm making is if, and I say, of course, in this <coughs> company here, there'll be none of you carrying cocaine, and therefore my dog will, will do, be asked to pay perhaps 300 questions. No, 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 no. Those are all the questions the dog's going to answer, because he's going to screen each one of you. 300 no's. Now, in old-fashioned training, 300 no's is no reward for the dog. But the dog has worked 300 times. So, and he's given the correct answer 300 times, so why should he not be rewarded for being correct? And that's how we've changed the training. And what that's enabled us to do is meant that, if you look at the bottom, uh, bottom right, the false positive of a dog on, in our disease detection dogs um, is around 
And we actually believe probably that 5% is often because there's something confusing, genuinely confusing the dog, rather than just saying, no, I'm just doing this. And we're going to show you an example of how the dog is able to um, clear samples from, from, from controls, even though they have, may have other diseases. So at the moment in biodetection, these are the uh, diseases we're currently, and conditions we're currently uh, um, investigating. And um, having you know, huge, huge success. Um, some odours, malaria odour, for example, we now know dogs can smell somebody who's infected with the malaria parasite, um, actually seem quite strong to the dog. So um, it's uh, gonna be a huge area because one of the main problems for malaria um, transmission is that the mosquitoes themselves bite people with malaria. They choose to bite malaria carriers, which is how the, the mosquito population remains infected. Um, so um, this could be, have huge interest. Dogs in that situation will be working at points of entry in countries as you go through. Instead of being smelt for drugs um, or explosives, the dog will sniff your ankle to see if you're carrying malaria parasite. So you can see how the dog model would work there. But in other models, this may be what will happen. So this is when Florin flew to MIT in Boston and she met the quantum physicist who has developed the bioelectronic nose. So that is, don't ask me too much about it, but he's somehow done a nose that is able to um, measure odour in a similar way to the biological method rather than a, a mass spectrometry um, machine method. But he has to ask the only thing in the world that knows what cancer smells like to build the algorithm. And that's what she's doing. <laughs> she knows what it smells like, Andreas doesn't. So the next four or five years is about us training dogs to be able to teach Andreas and his team what the smell of cancer is. So if I say to you, what does lavender smell like? For those that remember lavender smell, actually even for those people who can smell lavender now, you try and explain to the person sitting next to you what it smells like, you can't. The nearest thing you'll get to is flowery and that won't help you at all. So if you want to learn what lavender smells like, you get lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pieces of lavender and you keep saying very lavendery, not very lavendery, extremely lavendery in that you get what's called data points and that's what AI learns from, artificial intelligence. And that's how artificial intelligence is going to learn what cancer smells like. So, um, and we proved that, that that did work. And these are, the, these are the guys out in the Gambia who gave us their socks. Um, <laughs> their special socks. We've done quite a lot of R&D R with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. They capture volatiles really well. They were uh, worn for 24 hours and sent back to the London School and then the dogs sniffed part of the sock. Oops. Pseudomonas, um, we've done a huge amount with bacteria. With bacteria are smelly. I mean, I think a lot of microbiologists know this. Um, we're doing a lot of finding dogs that are very good at defining different types of bacteria. And actually, it could be very interesting because we we'll do the demonstration in a minute, but it might not just be the dopamine changes that are causing changes of odour in, in, in Parkinson's um, patients, but it could also be the change in your microbiome. And the question is, did that happen before or after the Parkinson's, which is another question uh, in itself. So I think, um, I'm going to carry on now. I think we, do you want to get, are you, are you set up ready? So I don't have to tell you um, about Parkinson's disease. Um, what um, we have done is a, an early proof of principle study. We found that dogs seem to be able to detect the odour of Parkinson's disease um, very well and that they can do it from a swab, which is um, either taken from across the forehead or preferably from the back, just the back of the neck here. Um, there were papers done in many, many, uh, soon after Parkinson's um, was identified that um, late Parkinson's patients often had a sort of slight change in the sebum, um, almost like a sort of um, adolescent change. And this is where the interest came as to whether or not there was any odour change in the sebum. So our first paper is um, currently being prepared, um, but um, this is one of the dogs that was in the study. And um, he's going to work on samples that have come from patients with Parkinson's and from patients that have come to the clinic with, with other diseases. Now, he's never worked in an environment where there's a lot of Parkinson's odour in the environment. Mm -hmm. So um, he normally works in a, in a sort of area where um, there's a fairly, in fact, I can show you the video quickly and then you'll be able to see, uh, hopefully, if I can show you this, you can see where the dog would normally work. I don't know if this plays. Wow. 
to start to see it, we can help doctors diagnose Parkinson's disease earlier. Which would be amazing. The degenerative condition affects more than 10 million people worldwide. It's often only identified years after symptoms first appear. Breakfast Jim Muppet has been to see the dogs in action. Kiwi is demonstrating a remarkable skill. This is one of our fully trained cats that takes dogs, and this dog is a cancer cell from the human cell. Dogs can smell the odor of human disease, and they sound incredible, don't they? But when we have a detection of a psychiatrist taking our whole year, this changes our smell. What we hope to do is to train them to find the odor associated with Parkinson's disease. The research and training will take six months, but 200 years after the condition was identified, it's hoped dogs will soon help doctors diagnose Parkinson's earlier. Tip up with BBC News. So, um... That's where they normally work. So it's a bit of a different situation here. But um, so that little Parkinson's dog belongs to me. He's a rescue dog. And I'm sure you'll all be very pleased that they all have, um, we have a no kennel policy, complete no kennel policy. So all these dogs live out in homes and come in at nine o'clock in the morning and go home about three o'clock. So it's a very short day. So what we're going to do is going to show you how the dogs work, show you how, how rapidly they're able to do this. Um, Mark will call, uh, will give me a call if he thinks that, that bump is not settled enough. They have to sniff each sample quite carefully. I mean, these are volatiles. These are like um, small uh, perfumes coming off, off these very small pieces of gauze. And the dog has to be able to smell them carefully in order to make his decision. Um, but I think on this line, um, as far as I can remember, um, I'm, it's, it's, in, it's, in the, it's in the middle one. So um, we'll start um, bump off and you can see how he works. If he, as you saw in the video, if he smells Parkinson's odour on one of these samples, he will, will stop and sit, make it quite clear, he won't move on. Okay? Okay. okay. It's a little bit unsettled to start with. Do you want to do... Are we done then? Yeah. I don't know if you could hear the inhale. Was, uh, some of you may from the front be able to. At, at work, we can put mics on them so we can hear how much air they're drawing. Um, but um, they really draw quite hard when they come across the odour. It's in position one now. Not to be fooled, he says. <laughs> okay, so we're going to yeah, happy with the next one. Yep, come up. Yeah. So we're going going to change the sample now so that there'll be no Parkinson's odour in this in this in this lineup at all. So all these individuals will be um, samples will be taken from people who may have other other symptoms, um, and um, but are not believed to have Parkinson's. So what you're going to see is that the dog is quite happy to indicate that everybody's healthy. That there's no, <laughs> that there's no, <laughs> very fed up about it. That there's no Parkinson's in this line at all. And in the training centre that you saw, they come back. They have a very clear route that they come back to to say that there's no Parkinson's. Probably all that happened here is a bumper will just come off the line and indicate to Mark that there's no Parkinson's on this line. Okay, so no Parkinson's in that line. Okay, so that's other. And um, for um, interest, the, um, there's going to be another, another patient brought on that in now um, who um, has, has, has kindly given a sample. And both these patients in this line today um, are drug naive. So they gave their samples before they were on medication. So there can be no um, confounding um, odour that the medication might cause and also we're very very careful in our in our trials that we have as much background as possible so actually the way we train the dogs is to add everything you can think of and teach dogs to ignore it so we don't try and keep things very very um, narrow we basically say this is this is the odour you're looking for it's the only odour you're looking for and there'll be everything else in there and just ignore it so it's now in position three the new patient OK, 
Okay, you can clap the dog if you like. He does like it. <laughs> Thank you, Bumper. Thank you, Mark. So you see, it's it's for the dog really quite a quick decision, um, and um, you know he's, he has to have a good sniff. But once he had a good sniff, he, he knows the answer. He's sure of his answer. And on in the trial, I can let you know that. Uh, um, Bumper was working at about 84% sensitivity. We don't know why the 15% he wasn't able to find, and we'll be able to discover more in the future. His specificity was 90, 97%. 97%. So very, very rarely was he saying somebody had Parkinson's if they hadn't. And again, that 3%, we might need to consider why there's perhaps a 3% that he was making a mistake on. Um, so um, what we're hoping is is that this um, will assist, and again, it's exactly the same as the speakers um, previous to myself, that it becomes part of the test. It isn't the only test, but it's part of the test that can really, really assist in, 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 in early diagnosis. What we're really interested in is whether the dogs can pick this up really, really early, and that's, that's what we're interested in. Um, we talk about the prodromal um, Parkinson's. It could be that dogs can pick up this change in odour um, then it, this can make a huge difference to early diagnosis. I'm just going to show you the interactive. Because what we're doing is, so we're talking about the data points, we're talking about the points where the dog can give an answer. And what we are understanding now is that the answers you saw today, that you saw with your eyes, were pretty much um, binary. So it was a yes or no, wasn't it? But actually the dog's giving you huge am amounts more information than that. And when we slow things down or when we work at the centre and we train the dogs to apply pressure to the stand, basically train a dog to say, if you're really sure, if it's really strong, so this is really, really, really parkinson or very, very, very cancer -y, then hit the stand really hard. Push it really hard, say, this is it, this is really it. And what you also find is they give a lot of behavioural indication as well. They wag their tails really fast, they stare at it. At, talking about their pupils dilate it's the, it's the, because they know they're going to get the reward. We can measure all these things. Now, what would that tell us? Well, that will tell us how strong the odour is. And we may find that that will give us indications of how well somebody's um, responding to medication, how quickly their Parkinson's may develop, a whole range of things that we may be able to measure through this person's change in odour. Now, the way we're going to do it is by working with scientists who make these stands for, for us. Um, the little guy with the, having the bad hair day obviously presses the stand very differently to the big guy on the right. So each dog has its own uh, stands that are um, calibrated for the dog. But then we're able, as Bumper, we're able to measure how much pressure he uses. And you could little video here of Bumper actually working on the stands. So you'll be able to see him here. So this is working back at the center. And you'll see for the Parkinson's patient, so I believe it's the number three for this one. Yeah. Okay. See all that, all that measure, all that stuff. Now that, that, this is being measured by the sensor. What it means is I don't even have to be with the dog. I can see that the dog has made a positive indication by the readout I'm getting. And what you almost get is a um, you should hear a sort of measure of, of the this Parkinson's odour strength. So the bottom one there is the strong with the Parkinson's patient and the two above are the other controls. Um, so this is your blank line. So um, you see for, for, for non-Parkinson's patients, the readout is looking much more even. So the software is reading and you actually get at the end completely very even sort of I can, see that, I can see that they're not Parkinson's patients. There's no Parkinson's over there. So this is the future, really, of measuring the dog's response, not just a trainer saying yes and no or whatever. So I think I'm pretty much done. But um, just to show we have our clients, um, as I'm saying, that work one-on-one. Um, -on -one, um, and I'll just show you the difference that the dog would make. So this is a lady who suffers frequent. She has no hypoglycemic awareness at all. Uh, frequently goes into nighttime comas, half past four in the morning. Um, this is the dog starting to alert, and she's becoming quite restless. She's having a what would have probably resulted in a coma. Um, and the dog's um, <laughs> smelt the odour, and he's not going to give up until she wakes up. And she's not had a nighttime coma since having the dog.
This was somebody that was having regular nighttime comas. There's no way he's going to miss it. Um, this lady, interesting, you'll see in a minute, this lady's actually got a pet dog who's not trained, um, who appears at a certain point in the night, um, does not warn her that her blood sugars are going dangerously low. She's taking her blood now. Um, but um, once the dog is trained to sit quietly while the person takes their blood, if she finds she's in um, low blood, she would then be asked to take sugar herself and then reward the dog, although many owners do it the other way around, which is... What's she going to do? She's going to reward the dog, then take sugar herself, and then her friend arrives. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't very helpful until the treats appeared. <laughs> um, and we have, I won't be able to play, we haven't got time, but uh, this is a lady with pots, so she has this drop, these sudden drop attacks. And, uh, oh, sorry, I won't be able to play that. And just to uh, thank Michelle and, and um, all the team for all the fantastic work. My dad has Parkinson's, so I um, feel very um, aware of all the, the, the huge difficulties that are associated with the disease and anything that we can do with our dogs to help. Um, you know, we would absolutely love to be part of it. And um, if anybody's interested in the charity, this is um, a teeny weeny charity plug. This is um, a book I wrote for the charity few years ago, which talks about my dog Daisy, who um, warned me of my own um, breast cancer. Um, she was actually a prostate detector dog, but she warned me of my breast cancer, and uh, I had lymph um, lymph node, um, I had um, removal, lymph node removal, and radiotherapy. And I'm here ten years later to tell the tale. So yeah. Thank you very much. Can you tell me? Is that working? <laughs> um, is there a particular breed of dog that is more able to detect signs of various diseases? Yeah, for, for the biodetection work that you've seen, we tend to use a lot of the gun dog breeds because they love finding. That's their, that's their thing in life for a lot of them. They love searching and finding and they actually get a, a dopamine hit themselves when they find something. They just love it. But um, for the dogs that work as assistance dogs, we use a, a, a good, bigger variety of dogs, but they have to be dogs that bond really well because those dogs, the dogs are sniffing around you all the time for your change. So um, we, use, we have got some poodles, we've got um, a, couple, a Yorkie cross, so we've got a few breeds, but they do tend to predominantly be, be your gun dog breeds. So it's mainly gun dogs, really? Spaniels, Labradors, he's a working golden retriever, yeah, in the main. Got one to the back there, and then you next. Uh, does it upset the dog by having all of us nearby? It's a good question. We were, we did wonder. We have got a patients that come or, 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 or clients that come and have Parkinson's that have worked, have been in the working area, because they've very kindly given us samples for training. So we were, we knew that that Bumper being around an individual with Parkinson's wasn't an issue. He, my father comes quite often to the centre, but we did wonder with, obviously there's quite a, 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 a going to be quite a volume, quite a, a, a odour change in the room that it might put him off, but it certainly hasn't. He's very laid back. They, they know, they're, very, they're trained very specifically, so he realises his work is on stands. His job is not to go around you guys, so he probably just basically ignores you in a nice way. <laughs> uh, it... That's absolutely lovely and heartwarming, and this is a slightly different issue, but what I've been thinking of is, should I try to train my dog to wake me up when I'm having an RBD attack? Yeah, yeah I know. It's not a matter of smell, of No, course, no, absolutely. We, 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 we have dogs now that wake up individuals who have severe PTSD, um, and they'll wake the gen he, 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 we managed to train a dog to wake the gentleman up before he goes into disassociation, which he was doing prior to having the dog, and he was being hospitalised all the time. Um, so yes, absolutely, we, our dogs will wake people up. And basically, any raise in cortisol is quite smelly, mm. um, and um, dogs are pretty good at picking up that cortisol and adrenaline change. So yeah, absolutely, and sort of movement as well would cause that sort of thing. So absolutely, it's a possibility. That would be the other side of our programme, but yes. Mm. 